Before we get to my interview with uh, Ed Hurst, energy economist from University of Houston, first of all, I want you to look at this graphic from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. What it shows is uh, you, uh, Texas electricity load growth for the next two years, 2025 and 2026. It's an astonishing 23 or 24%. Keep in mind that there are provinces like BC that are, uh, that are forecasting load growth of only 2% per year. We're talking 12% per year. That's an extraordinary growth and it's very difficult for power grids uh, to handle and it's happening all over the world. Texas is just one example. So we're gonna to talk to Ed about that, about why uh, and um, some of the uh, behind the meter options that industrial and large commercial customers have. So welcome to the interview, Ed. Thank you. Well, the, that, uh, I mean, we all know that the, the U.S. Uh, load demand is going up faster than it ever it has for a long time. It's like three and a half, four percent a year. But the, the graph for Texas is quite a bit more than that. Why so much in Texas? Well, uh, first of all, Texas had not invested, and because of the ERCOT market model, it never paid the independent power producers to invest. Uh, 25 years ago, Texas uh, essentially deregulated, as they call it, uh, or re-regulated the grid, and it did not pay the, the incumbent generators to reinvest. They did not expand. In fact, they contracted from um, 2010, when state GDP was one25 trillion to 2021 when state GDP was 1.99 trillion. The portfolio of coal, natural gas, and nuclear power plants actually shrank over that period of time. And you know the only thing that's saving Texas today is an incredible growth in uh, wind farms and especially in solar farms. This has, has led to a lot of data centers thinking about moving to Texas. This growth projection, which is just a projection, is, is my way of thinking, a, a potential. Um, many of the data centers are applying to different states, different grids to see where they connect first, where they can get interconnects, where they can get transmission, where they can get power plants. We've seen a huge amount of growth in the PJM, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland area, especially in Virginia, because well, I mean, not only did America Online start there, uh, but you know, that's the Defense and National Security Center for the nation. So data centers are are, are large there. Texas, uh, in particular, welcomed cryptocurrency miners. Uh, the last time ERCOT issued any kind of data on that, uh, those cryptocurrency miners were using uh, the same amount of electricity as the city of Austin. Now, Today, there's a big lawsuit pending where the Public Utility Commission and ERCOT don't want to release the data of how many cryptocurrency miners are on the grid because they say that would be a national security issue. This is a ridiculous sidebar. I'm sorry. Uh, but an interesting sidebar, Ed. Now, look, um, one of the ways that uh, grids like ERCOT can uh, manage this uh, is for large industrial users and uh, large commercial users to self-generate. And, and usually what that means is solar plus a battery plus digital controls. And then they can sell back into the grid uh, when they the price uh, makes it profitable for them to do so. Um, is that one of the options that Texas, that is likely to expand in Texas? Well, that's what's been going on. The uh, digital net metering, the swaps, if you will. Uh, the solar farms, keep in mind, though, are are distant from the the commercial centers of Texas. And so the data centers have to co-locate with the solar farms, co-locate with the batteries. Because if, 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 for example, we built one, a data center in Houston, but contracted with a data center out in the rural area, West Texas, we would still be relying upon the ERCOT transmission system to get that electricity into the grid. And of course, we'd still be getting electricity from the coal plant down the street. Um, but we'd be relying upon the integrity of the ERCOT grid. And we know that the integrity of the ERCOT grid to, to keep operating under adverse weather conditions is, is not good. Uh, I gave a talk a couple of months ago to more than 40 
petrochemical refinery industrial plant managers in Lamarck, Texas, along the, the Texas Gulf Coast. They are desperately working to build power plants behind the meter or inside the fence because they know they can't rely upon the ERCOT grid to deliver electricity from distant areas. And, and they also know that, that the local distribution system, uh, Texas, New Mexico Power, uh, Centerpoint, um, they have underinvested in the wires and poles. And, you know, for example, with Hurricane Barrel last summer, uh, the grid wasn't restored for more than three, week, three weeks. And, and for these industrial and petrochemical plants, plastic plants, yeah, if they go offline for five or 10 minutes, that's the same as being offline for a month or more because restarting these, these heat exchangers, the plastic vats, the crackers, it's, it's a very intricate industrial process. And sometimes you have to take these apart and clean out the gunk that seized up inside the pipes. Well, I know this is a an issue that um, uh, other jurisdictions are dealing with because I've interviewed folks in Latin America about this. Uh, Alberta, which has a, a market uh, electricity market similar to to ERCOT, um, has gone out and talked to stakeholders, and they've raised the the issue of who, if you have uh, plants that are co located behind the meter, but still connected to the grid as a backup. Who pays for that extra infrastructure? And there's a concern that existing customers will be subsidizing some of these behind the meter plants. Is that an issue in ERCOT? That's a that's a real concern. Um, and it's a real concern, for example, in, in MISO, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator that, that extends from Lake Charles to Manitoba. It's a big issue in PJM, Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland. Uh, in fact, President Trump, just a few weeks ago at the Pennsylvania Energy Summit announced $92 billion of electricity intensive uh, in industrial investment in Pennsylvania. And, and he, he made a startling and uh, uh, stinging comment about Texas. You know, much better to have this here in Pennsylvania where you can, you can connect into the grid easily. You can sell electricity back and, and not be down in Texas where they really mess things up. So um, how are we going to sort this out? Because it seems like the large players and you, you know, uh, you mentioned the petrochemical plants that when they're down, restarting them is a, you know, takes a long time and, and is very expensive. Well, that's true of many other plants in different in, in different industries is a big, a big concern. So you can see why the big players who have the capital resources to do it would invest in behind the meter self-generation. Um, but how is the industry adapting to that? I mean, you know, looking out over the next two to five years, um, what are some of the solutions to it? Well, the challenge with a grid such as ERCOT or PJM today, uh, perhaps with Alberta, is it doesn't pay the independent power producers to actually build plants, new natural gas power plants, in advance uh, of, of the market. And with the growth in wind and solar, that can undercut the most of the year, most of the day, they're not gonna make a return on investment. So these grids, the grid operators, they can't make investments. Um, the, the exception, I guess, was California Independent System Operator who contracted for 5,000 megawatts of natural gas generation four years ago to, to shore up the grid. That helped a lot. But you know, the grid managers are really just in a reaction mode. These data centers, uh, because most of them are subscription based, uh, for example, the advanced GROC, um, Amazon, um, yeah, Siri, uh, who may start talking in a minute here, <laughs> any, of, uh, any of those, they're subscription based. And so the, the hosts have the wherewithal to build power plants. You know, Pennsylvania is attractive because of the Marcellus and Utica gas shale plays. Um, Texas is attractive because of the Permian Basin. Not, you know, a huge gas supply that, that basically is free while the oil is, is flowing and um, a lot of access to, to wind and solar. That, that's what's going to drive it. The data centers can afford to build it. They will. The grid operators are just going to have to react Okay, so uh, for folks who are probably not familiar with how the system operators work, 
Um, what you're saying is that in these markets, which are energy only markets, as I understand it, uh, the, the demand has to get to a certain point where uh, uh, a power generator, uh, like a utility, will then build another plant. They don't build them in, in advance of the, the demand. They have to wait till the demand gets to a certain level to justify the investment, which then uh, begs the question, what do you do until it gets to that point? Have I got that correct? Yes, and, and let me add some, some perspective to that. Anytime you build a capital facility, uh, a big power plant, it's, it's a sunk cost. And of course, Wall Street requires that that capital employee earn a return on capital, but you know, the consumer doesn't see it that way. Nice of you to build that for me. Um, and so the, the gas power plant, which may be paying $4 per MCF and maybe have a, 150 employees uh, versus the coal power plant, which is paying $4 to $6 per MMBTU for the coal plus disposal, may have 1,000 employees. The, the nuclear power station, um, 550 employees per gigawatt. Uh, the solar farms, uh, 12 full-time employees, six of whom might be shepherds for a one gigawatt solar farm. And so, and so they can undercut everybody else in the power stack if the sun is shining. If the sun doesn't shine, they don't have any cost. And, and so on that basis, if you're not paying for capital, it, it really comes down to uh, every, not everybody's in play every day because you know peak demand is you know a few weeks in august and september and a few weeks in september uh, uh, january and february right okay so there's always uh the the system has to uh if i understand this correctly be almost in a deficit uh it can't produce enough power until it gets to a certain point then a utility will come along and build a power plant to service that extra that extra load which and because there, you know, Wall Street uh, requires a return on its capital. When you don't have your a power plant, uh, or if a power plant is idle, how do you pay the capital? I... Exactly. So in states such as uh, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, these are vertically integrated utilities that uh, have their portfolio of power plants. The corporations that run these optimize the dispatching of power. It's not run by the government. I mean, essentially. Every one of these grid operators is an old style Soviet purchasing bureau. It doesn't pay for capital. It pays to have the electricity there day by day. Uh, it's the market maker. Uh, as I, I liken it, let's, let's think about the Toronto Blue Jays. If they were paid this way, then only those Blue Jays taking the field today would get paid. Those on the bench don't get paid. And, and so there's no incentive actually to build a bench to build for reliability. Uh, if you go extra innings, uh, that's the way most of America's electricity is is operated today, and it's it's a a, a very foolish, short sighted approach that unfortunately has been in play for more than twenty five years. Okay, let's wrap up the interview this way, uh, Ed. Uh, so, where do where does self generation fit into this imperfect market? an imperfect uh, system that ERCOT has, and apparently uh, most of America has, Alberta has, um, is because uh, I know Alberta has sold the idea of self-generation by industrial operations as a way to relieve strain, strain on the grid, but you're saying that that maybe is not the case? Well, it depends on, on the grid operator making certain, or the, the regulatory body, the Public Utility Commission, making certain that the, the consumers who are already there aren't paying a disproportionate share of the, of the freight, of the cost, if you will. You know, we've, seen, we've seen independent power producers such as NRG just acquired a, a portfolio of natural gas power plants for less than 50 cents on the dollar of what it would cost to build them new. So that tells us what the market value is of building new generation. It's less than the cost of replacement. Ed, thank you very much for this, as always. Good to see you.